address us. Asante sana. Welcome, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy President. Please, let's take our seats. <clears throat> um, Mr. Deputy President, Your Ladyship, the Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya and President of the Supreme Court, Prime Cabinet Secretary, DCJ, um, our Attorney General, the Director of Public Prosecutions, Justices of the Supreme Court, Justice William Mutunga, Chief Justice Emeritus, Justice Maraka, Chief Justice Emeritus, Madam Nancy Barasa, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Jambo. Um, I'm truly happy to be here this morning. Um, I know um, you have convened this meeting, as was explained to us, to reflect about uh, 12 years and to listen to stakeholders, uh, people who are affected by your decisions, people who, um, in one way or another, um, become part of the court system, and uh, unlike Sakaja, who has never been a client at the Supreme Court, I am a very consistent uh, <laughs> cli <laughs> client at the Supreme Court. I have been brought before Chief Justice Mutunga. I have been brought before Chief Justice uh, Maraga. I was the other day before um, Chief Justice Kome, and as things would be, sometimes I get favorable judgment, sometimes I don't. But in all cases, I have uh, abided by what the decisions of the Supreme Court were. <laughs> and therefore, it was, if there was a person to, um, as a stakeholder, to uh, give an assessment. I think I qualify to be among the few people who uh, have been before the Supreme Court many times. Um, the four, uh, the Chief Justice uh, referred to the four presidential elections that have been adjudicated by the Supreme Court. In all the four, I have been, I have been a client. I was, among, I was in there. And therefore, it is an honor for me to join you in commemorating 12 years since the establishment of Kenya's Supreme Court, an iconic institution that, along with devolution and the Bill of Rights, stands as one of the most transformative innovations in our progressive 2010 Constitution. As Kenya's apex judicial body, the Supreme Court is, entr is entrusted with the sacrosanct mandate to uphold and promote the purpose and principles of our constitutional order. By virtue of its unique complement of exclusive original appellate and advisory jurisdictions, it is and it possesses the necessary authority to arbitrate, to advise, and to guide the institutions of our republic as they perform their roles of giving full expression to the will of the people as inscribed in our constitution. The Supreme Court, therefore, serves a powerful symbolic role as the highest representation of the values and institutions of justice in our land and the fulfillment of people's determined quest for a judiciary grounded in inclusivity, fairness, justice, and constitutionalism. 
It was designed not merely to interpret law, but also to resolutely underwrite and defend justice for all Kenyans. 14 years after the promulgation of the Constitution, we continue on the journey of implementing the vision for a stable, secure, prosperous, open, and democratic society grounded in freedom, justice, and the rule of law. And central to this monumental endeavor is the Supreme Court, which has guided the judiciary in orienting the national ideology towards the legitimate pursuit of every aspiration and, the, and resisting the temptation to compromise our values for the illusion of political expediency, however well-meaning. Twelve years after its establishment, it is difficult for us to imagine how the Republic of Kenya existed for many decades without a Supreme Court. It has helped us reject the many false dichotomies that once constrained our policies and politics, including the belief that freedom must be sacrificed for security and that democracy and stability are mutually exclusive, or that sustainable development is the monopoly of the centralized government. You've heard Sakaja speak very eloquently about what the Supreme Court has done on matters devolution. It is therefore fitting that this conference invites us to reflect on the Supreme Court's jurisprudence over the past 12 years. In doing so, we recognize both successes and areas for critique as we consider the court's evolution, its impact on Kenya's constitutional landscape, and its commitment to protecting the rights and aspirations of all Kenyans. True to the court's philosophy, bold honesty is the best policy. And this occasion calls us to reflect candidly on its journey, progress, challenges, and impact. To appreciate the achievement, the achievement represented by the Supreme Court's creation, we must revisit the hard lessons of the 2007 presidential election crisis. That crisis exposed deep-seated systemic failures and a profound erosion of public trust in our electoral and judicial processes, fracturing the people's trust in the rule of law. Consequently, a disputed election outcome triggered underlying conflicts that nearly drove the nation to the brink of almost total collapse. It was realized then that rebuilding trust and restoring faith in the rule of law was indispensable and that a credible, authoritative mechanism for resolving presidential election disputes was the only way to prevent elections from threatening rather than renewing our nationhood. The 2010 Constitution therefore established the Supreme Court as a unique institution with hybrid jurisdiction, symbolizing its special status. Its exclusive original jurisdiction over presidential election disputes is a legacy of the 2000 never again moment. Its hybrid appellate jurisdiction, which depends on the existence of a unique issue deserving authoritative determination by the court, aims to restore confidence in the judiciary while its advisory mandate enables state organs and county governments to seek authoritative guidance on best practice for policy formulation and also policy implementation. The body of work that the Supreme Court has developed over the course of the 12 years is expansive, meaningful, and authoritative. It would be tedious for me to dissect all of the outputs today, and in any event, my very able Attorney General is here to do that for me at a later occasion. Suffice it to say, the court's jurisprudence demonstrates its capacity to address complex issues, clarify the law, stabilize policy, and meet the expectations of the people of Kenya. There is no doubt that the Supreme Court has not been short of critics, 
during the past 12 years. Its decisions have been and will be debated and dissected vigorously. And in a number of cases, disagreements will linger for long. Nevertheless, it would be unduly pessimistic to overlook the court's clear efforts to interpret the Constitution with wisdom, reinforcing pillars of democracy, justice, equality, freedom, good governance, accountability, and the rule of law in a very robust way with immense clarity. Sometimes citizens, including myself, myself agree. Sometimes we don't. But we are bound to respect. It has pronounced itself on a broad range of pertinent issues across legal landscape, and in so doing, entrenched certain principles and values as non-negotiable procedural and substantive elements of good policy. It is because the court has been emphatic in its dispositions and firm in its guidance of subordinate courts that Kenyans are confident that their rights are intact and due process is indispensable. In turn, this confidence has fostered courage, openness, and vigor in our society. Values the Constitution envisioned for the Supreme Court and the judiciary in terms of being faithful to what the Constitution expected of the judiciary, we can confidently say you have passed the mark. It is therefore quite fair to say that the court has stood as a faithful custodian of our Constitution, a defender of fundamental rights, and a pillar of democracy. Its sustained capacity to resolve complex constitutional matters remains critical to our nation's institutional vitality now and going into the future. Even as we celebrate the court's achievements, we must recognize that there remains some way to go for us to reach the Constitution's promised land, that the pursuit of justice is an ending, and that as long as we are free and a democratic nation, competition and disagreement will require resolution. And therefore, you must always be present, alive, with clarity to resolve. The Supreme Court must continue to evolve, maintain ideological clarity, intellectual rigor, and remain connected to the lived experiences of all Kenyans. A forward-thinking, innovative, and responsive court is essential for addressing the complex challenges of our time. Allow me to um, just say something in that context, especially on the paragraph I've just elaborated, that we, we live in a, in a very dynamic uh, world. And it's not always that I find an occasion where I am before the Chief Justice, DCJ, all the justices of the Supreme Court. And as a citizen, to try and, you know, speak to some of the issues that sometimes, you know, engage my mind. And one of the issues that I would want to say is, in this complex and dynamic space, and as was said very ably by the Chief Justice, where you have social media, you have, you know, all manner of um, pressures, sometimes from anonymous people, anonymous, you know, um, yeah, characters, and let me not abuse them, um, people, anonymous, you know, people who nobody knows uh, what is, what is, what, what is their push? What happens, for example, with a government that has been elected 
on the basis of a manifesto. What is the place of a manifesto? A program that has been voted for by millions of Kenyans alongside a candidate and a party. What weight does the court put whenever there is a challenge on a manifesto? I would want to invite the court to think about it. What, what, how do you respond to litigants, individuals, that challenge a policy and a manifesto position canvassed among the citizens of Kenya, voted by the people of Kenya, and how do we use the place of manifesto to remove politics of personalities and instead try to you know consolidate the place of politics that is around a program a policy an agenda how does the court help us to consolidate the place of getting away politics from being about personalities or sometimes even about ethnicity, and taking it to the realm of issues, policies, programs, and how do we work together to make sure that we consolidate the place of a development trajectory, a program, a national program, backstopped by the people of Kenya through an election and rolled out by an elected government. And sometimes, as uh, was said again by my younger brother Sakaja, if you have a program, you have a program canvassed by a political party, a government being rolled out, and sometimes it's not very, it's not, a, it's not populist. Sometimes, you know, as politicians, you have a balance between being popular and doing the right thing. Sometimes they, are not, they don't go together. And then you sacrifice your political capital to do the right thing. But then the court on the other side decides to be popular. And undermine uh, the, 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 the agenda that you have. And, and allow me, Madam Chief Justice, you know, to, to appear before you on this matter. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope I am not abusing the court process, you know, on this matter. You know, I'm just trying to, uh, in, a, in a very simple way, to put my thoughts across so that, you know, maybe the court can apply its mind to it and help us, you know, chart this course as, as Kenyans. Because uh, it's me today, it's somebody else tomorrow, it's the next person the next day. And we all must uh, think about this. So that particular matter it, it, it sometimes uh, uh, is a matter that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that informs some of the things that we do. And I, I am a layman, but we're told that the court also makes decisions. In, sometimes they have to factor in public interest. Where does public interest, populism, playing to the gallery, where is that? You know, how, how, do, we, how do we nuance it so that it is managed properly and uh, we don't we don't drop the we don't drop the pole. So th this is uh, just thoughts, uh, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm really happy that uh, uh, Madam Chief Justice has, 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 has said it clearly that we, we need to we need to consult more.
you know, at the institutions. What has become clear during the course of constitutional implementation and in the life of the Supreme Court is that notwithstanding the, people, the principle of separation of powers and the need for checks and balances, cooperation between organs of government and among state institutions is necessary, is also desirable, and this is for the promotion of national interest and constitutionalism. And that brings me again to the matter that was canvassed by my deputy here. Um, and um, my sister Njoki um, spoke to it and said, we need independence, we need to avoid overreach and interference. You know? Overreach and interference, you know, that kind of thing. Now, um, we must be careful as uh, the executive to avoid overreach and interference. Because we always talk about judicial independence. And it's a fundamental principle of our Constitution. And there is a remedy for executive overreach. Because the judiciary will do something about it. But what happens when we have judicial overreach? and judicial, independent, uh, judicial interference. Who, who will help us to, to resolve it? You know? I, I know these are, these, are, these are, and I'm not, I hope I'm not making difficult things here. I'm just asking myself as a layman. And maybe they, they, I now have a good uh, deputy, a professor. Maybe he'll help educate me when we have some time. <laughs> but again, I would... Um, I would really want to ask ourselves, and uh, so that as we restrain ourselves as the executive, not to interfere, not to overreach on matters that are in the purview of the judiciary or other arms of government for that matter, I think there is an equally very high responsibility on the part of the judiciary to restrain itself, and I think the Chief Justice here said so, to restrain itself on matters that are in the purview of other arms of government so that we can have um, the committee of working together and uh, the interdependence while respecting our, um, our independence or the independence of other arms of government. Um, such moments are rare, you know, when, when you have the, the ears of the judiciary. <clears throat> um, I think I have said the, the three things that I really wanted, uh, just as a citizen, to, you know, juggle the minds of our judicial leaders and judicial officers um, so, so that we can, we can uh, we, we can work together in, in this space. <clears throat> Effective collaboration, this is what I'm talking about, in the national interest. And you had my deputy say, you know, there is public interest, which sometimes is about maybe what the social media has said. What, has, what, social, does, what the social media has said, is it public interest? What is it? You know, we, we need to, there must be a balance. And then there is national interest. These are propositions that we need to think about so that uh, we can carry it along in our jurisprudence and uh, also in our life as a nation. 
no single institution or organ is entire of itself or viable in isolation. I'm encouraged by the increased confidence with which various arms of government are exploring areas of partnership and collaboration. And by so doing, we are breaking long-standing barriers to unlock the power of institutional synergy. There's a lot that we can achieve through institutional synergy, finding ways that we can uh, make all the institutions work. And I agree with the Chief Justice that we must build strong institutions that can withstand even weaknesses of individuals. That in, uh, sometimes, uh, um, because we are human, sometimes in, individuals may um, be weak, but if you have strong institutions, they can even carry uh, uh, weak people across. Or stop uh, tyrants also. Uh, you know, strong institutions can stop rogue people from also taking advantage of the system. And as we have consistently and repeatedly demonstrated, such partnerships are beneficial when pursued transparently and in public interest. Through this approach, the executive has found opportunity to engage the legislature and judiciary over the national budget and also to support the expansion of judiciary's infrastructure, among other consultative endeavors. And today morning, we had a conversation with the Chief Justice and uh, the leadership of the judiciary on some of the aspects of modernization of our judiciary. And I must say, with a lot of clarity, that the judiciary has been phenomenal in its application of technology to deliver on its mandate. They have done a very commendable job that um, e-filing and making sure that even decisions can be made um, online has really enhanced the efficiency of the judiciary. And the rest of government need to come along. Um, and Um, 